Hello. Uh, yes, good evening, everyone. It's great, as usual, to see a, a full house on Sunday afternoon. Uh, I'm glad you've come to hear uh, what will be, I'm sure, an amazing talk on the amazing universe uh, by Francois Boucher. Uh, I, I'm Rajesh Kupakumar. I welcome you on behalf of ICTS. Uh, uh, this is a joint activity, as probably many of you know, between ICTS and the Planetarium, which has been uh, running for the last over two years. Uh, and, uh, uh, and it's always been heartening to get response from all of you, from different age groups. Uh, I see very young people and uh, all the way uh, uh, through the age spectrum. Uh, so um, uh, ICTS, as many of you have probably heard from me, is a new uh, institution in the north of Bangalore. And uh, uh, in addition to outreach activities like these, uh, we, uh, uh, which of course uh, with the uh, cooperation of the planetarium, we are very grateful for uh, this engagement uh, that uh, the planetarium has afforded. Uh, uh, but in addition to outreach events, we also run programs in a number of uh, research areas, and in fact, uh, the speaker today has come to ICTS as part of a, a, a month-long program on cosmology. Uh, in fact, it is about cosmology the next decade, about the new things that we are going to discover. Uh, 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 and it, we have a, a galaxy of uh, top uh, scientists uh, coming as part of this uh, program. And of course, we've utilized the opportunity to organize a number of lectures. Uh, uh, we will uh, also have on Tuesday uh, the second Vishweshwara Memorial Lecture uh, by Professor Lyman Page, uh, who is uh, uh, one of the, uh, the leading experimental cosmologists whose uh, results have, uh, who the results of uh, the experiments have really revolutionized our understanding of the cosmos and about which you will hear, I'm sure, uh, uh, today. But this, on the 22nd at 5 p.m., we'll have uh, the uh, second Vishweshwara Memorial Lecture at the ICTS campus, so please keep that in mind. Uh, we, I think, will have shuttles running from IAC and so on. Uh, you may remember last year around this time, Kip Thorn gave the inaugural uh, uh, Vishweshwara Memorial Lecture uh, at ICTS campus, and that was quite an event, and perhaps some of you uh, came for that, so this is the second in that series, uh, and will be by Lyman Page. Um, so, uh, so, uh, so we have programs, we have our research, and we have outreach activities like these. Uh, uh, but it's not just lectures. We would like to do a number of outreach activities. And today, I wanted to uh, bring to your attention something we are, uh, we will be announcing soon. Uh, uh, but uh, this is the idea of math circles. I don't know. Uh, is the uh, have people here heard of the notion of math circles? It is a, it's a notion that used to be very popular in Russia and then was transplanted to the United States uh, about a few decades ago. This is of bringing together young people who are passionate about mathematics uh, and uh, once in a few weeks and uh, get them to explore and uh, develop their passion for mathematics. It's not meant to be a problem-solving thing which is going to get you through the IIT or Olympiads or anything like that, but it's for the sake of exploring mathematics and getting a sense for how research in mathematics uh, 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 happens. And uh, so we would like to start a Bangalore math circles. And at this stage, uh, what I would like to spread the message amongst you and your friends is that if there are any maths teachers or educators, mathematics educators amongst you who would be interested in participating in this effort, please send an email to mathcircle, M-A-T-H-C-I-R-C-L-E, at ICTS, at the rate of ICTS.res.in. We'll also put it up and, uh, and uh, publicize it on our Facebook and other pages, but uh, I just thought I will uh, announce it here. Uh, math circle at ICTS.res.in. If you're a maths educator, a teacher who is uh, passionate about maths and would like to convey some of that to, the, uh, to uh, school children, middle school, high school children, 
please write to us and we'll try to get your involvement for this effort. So that's an example of the kind of outreach things we are doing. So without uh, more ado, I'll uh, hand it over to Professor Ajit from ICTS, uh, our uh, resident gravitational wave expert, uh, uh, who, uh, who will uh, introduce the speaker and um, his work. Thank you. Good afternoon. It, it's, a, it's a great uh, privilege to introduce our speaker of the day, Professor uh, Francois Boucher from the Institute of Astrophysics, Paris. Uh, Professor Boucher is a cosmologist, a physical cosmologist, who has done um, important work on a variety of topics in, in cosmology, including the study of the cosmic microwave background radiation and the study of large-scale structures, etc. cetera. Uh, but perhaps most importantly, uh, he has been a, a, one of the a small, a key people, a person uh, who uh, was responsible for the success of the Planck satellite by the European Space Agency, which made the most accurate picture of the early universe through its uh, exquisite measurements of the cosmic uh, microwave background radiation. And uh, today he's going to talk about one of his uh, favorite topics, our, our universe. So before uh, uh, we start with the, the lecture, I would like to um, ask uh, Professor uh, Saraswati Vishweshara to give a hand over a, a memento to Professor uh, Boucher, please. Professor Boucher. Hello, good afternoon. Um, to me, this is great to be back in India again. Uh, my first time was like uh, nearly 45 years ago. So uh, India has changed. It's always as wonderful and amazing. Amazing India is the slogan. But India is also within a broader context, within an amazing universe. And I'm going to be telling you a little bit about this. So there will be, it's a long tour. Uh, I will take you to the confines of space and time uh, with, the, with the help of our latest uh, time machine, which is a Planck satellite. And by the end of this talk, I hope you'll make sense of this icon, which, I mean, looks a little bit bizarre. It's actually the universe in a nutshell, and that covers everything from where we arose to what we observe today. So behind this, to be able to make sense of this, and which is very much at the core of how we think, I mean professionals, about the universe today, there are like four ideas. And I'll try to go through these four ideas with you and hope that you make them yours. Uh, so, cosmological questions have been around for a very, very long time. Uh, and what I'll be trying to do is to tell you somewhat about the answers, but even more importantly, how do we get to these answers? Because this is really what is important, is a process. How come we can even dare talk about this? I mean, you know, where, where are structures coming from? I mean, wh where, how were we assembled? I mean, these are precisely the dream of, of cosmologists, and, and this is science, and this is a new thing uh, that happened in the last century thanks to, in particular, the towering figure of Einstein. So first of all, uh, you will see a lot of oval shape, things like this. They are maps of the heaven, and they are a deformed way of representing the sphere. We are there, we look at the out outside, and well, we need to represent what is on the sphere. And so that's how we do it, and here you recognize the sphere as seen from the outside, but what we do is actually unroll what we see, and we show maps like this. So how does this look? Well, here it is. So let me orient you to your universe. Here is the center of our galaxy, the Milky Way, the sort of a uh, little shade of white that you see in, in clear nights. This is a galactic plane. Thousands of billions of stars like ours, which constitute our home galaxy. And so, and they are not resolved, in, which means, I mean, you, you, you just see this as a haze. Now, what has been done with a particular satellite was to actually map all resolved objects, which are galaxies like ours. So every single dot in this image is a galaxy like our own. 
Okay, so these are our cosmic scales. Already, when we look at this, it's sort of funny to, we sort of see that there are interesting patterns. There seem not to be many galaxies in this cone, in this direction. There seem to be a lot here, and then there is a hole here. And there seem to be some filamentary structures. Okay, well, we'll see. Uh, it's actually the two-dimensional projection, the projection on the plane of the sky of what is happening in, in, in the, the full three dimension. But for this, we need to add uh, an indicator of how far objects are. So here, it turns out that we are helped by the fact that our universe is expanding. So you see every little galaxy, each of these dots is a few billion stars. I mean, can they meet the star? And if we are here, we receive the light from this one, but through the process of the space expansion, the light has been redshifted. It has been redshifted to the red, and you can imagine that the further away you are, the further it's redshifted. Okay? Oh, that's pretty cool. So, this actually gives rise to an absolutely fundamental thing, which is called, by recent decision of the UIE, uh, the Hubble Lemaitre uh, law. And um, what Lemaitre, and using data from other guys that you don't know, Slipher, and noticing uh, by, by Lemaitre, he succeeded in having a distance to a few galaxies nearby at the turn of the 20th century. And he succeeded in having an indication of the velocity of recession, how far they go away. And he noted, well, you know, you have to be pretty bold, that there seemed to be a straight line between the two, what is called the linear regression, meaning, well, you could imagine that the further away you are, the faster away you are receding. That makes sense. That was encaptured in a law, which is here, V, the recession velocity, how far you go away, is proportional up to a constant, which is H according to Mr. Hubble, okay, which is of the order of, well, it doesn't matter, it's a numerical constant, which is proportional to the distance, at least when this is not too far. Well, fine, but we still need to go a little bit further because, oh, by the way, now this is a more modern version of this, and the Hubble law here was actually this part of the diagram. Okay, now the initial guess turned out to be absolutely right. You see that this is actually quite, quite a bit of a straight line, all the way to absolutely gigantic distances with millions of galaxies. Okay, so now we know that we can, if we can measure the velocity of a receding object, we can have its distance through its slope. Ah, but that's how do we get the velocity? Well, we need something else. This is called the Doppler effect. That it's the further, I mean, the, as I say, the, the, the light is um, turned into red when it's receding. It's the same thing that for, for noises, when you hear an, an ambulance or a car and so on coming and then going away, it's sort of you see it's, it's not redshifted, it's going to the uh, a pitch which is a lower pitch. That's the same effect. So what we do, and we've been doing this for a century, is to look at the light of distant objects. And we looked at all the various components of the light from, you know, violet to, to red. We separate this through the equivalent of a prism. And we recognize some lines which are due to some particular elements which are in these objects like they are in the lab. And we notice that these lines are not at the same uh, wavelength than they are in the laboratory. This is due to this recession velocity. So we can just look at how far those lines that we see in remote galaxies are displaced as compared to what they are in the lab. We get how much this is redshifted. And through the Hubble law, we know how far this is. Ah, so now, the third dimension of the universe is open to us. And that's, we'll do this. And so now let's take this picture. It's actually colored. The points there have a color, and the color is by how much this is redshifted. And this is telling you, I mean, that there is a mismatch of, you know, different distances. But now we can use this to actually look and peel like the onion and look at things at different distances. So 
when we take only the things that are nearby, we see our galaxy. That's what I showed you before. The center of our galaxy, the plane, and so on. And now, when you look at the small separation as compared to the lab, you see this. Okay, so there are like a big supercluster of objects, and galaxies are grouped in little groups, and they tend to be a line. And now let's look a little bit further, and further, and further, and further. So now you start seeing, you know, like, like the, the, the peel of an onion, the various structures of the universe. Now, you might actually, if you feel more familiar, you would just look as, as a, let's take now something that is going from us and looking at the universe in a small slab away from us. That's what we see. So this is a distribution in galaxies, but now that's, th that's the third dimension that I'm employing. I'm showing as a function of the recession of, of the redshift or recession velocity, that is to say the distance. So this is a, a thin slice, and we see the distribution. I mean, so our galaxy, our, you know, our sun is part of a 1,000 billion stars in there, and here is a distribution of the other galaxies around us. Well, you see, I mean, this is, this is not something that looks like random. For the trained physicists, I mean, it, it, it begs for an explanation. Where is it coming from? Was the universe always like this? Was it created with these structures, with you know, these long filaments, these places which are devoid of any galaxies? There are no homes there? Um, so that's, that has been the question for a very long time. And actually, it's been the, at the center stage from the earliest days of, of Lemaitre. There was the idea that uh, one day we would build a theory of how this came about. And I will just tell you that we have now ample verifications of that theory. Now, so the universe is expanding. We have access to the third dimension through redshift. That was one point. Another point that is absolutely crucial, which is actually central to all of cosmology and the understanding of why we can say anything is the, sp the speed of light is limited. It's finite. It's not infinite. There is no instantaneous transmission from one point to the other. The velocity is very large, 300,000 kilometers per second. So it's not perceivable in everyday life. But as soon as the objects are a little bit far away, it starts counting. So the moon, it takes 1.3 seconds for most purposes, for light to travel from the moon to us. It's about eight minutes for the sun. So, bear with me. When you look at the sun, well, with glasses, please, okay, when you look there, you are not seeing the sun as it is. You are seeing the sun as it was eight minutes ago. So all, if, all that you are perceiving is actually you are looking in the past. And of course, the further away you look, the further back in the past you are looking. So this is our time machine that we'll be using to great effect. Of course, it's, it's a one way. I mean, you cannot travel and change and so on. But that's, you can look at things how they were. So now, I'll get back to this image that I showed you before, which is just another rendition. Each of these objects is a galaxy and so on. We've seen that. Um, but what I've added here is how much time does it take for light to travel from here so that you get a sense of distance? Well, 2.5 million light years. Okay, so billion light years. So it took that much time. It's so far away that even at the speed of light, it takes a huge amount of time to travel. And then you can start thinking, well, well if we are not in an eternal universe, then things would have had ample time to, ev to evolve. So I should actually look at these. I mean, these are actually different. They are actually younger objects. So, of course, I mean, you have to look at absolutely gigantic distances. Well, because it takes so much time for light to travel. But then you are looking in a way distant past. So that's our time machine. This is absolutely essential to and understand why we can ask questions, because otherwise, how we, we, would we ever know about the, the birth of the universe and so on if we didn't have a way to confront our theories with observations? Now, there is, I don't know whether this works, usually it doesn't, yes, that's what I think. So, let's see, 
So here is a simulation I did back in the 2000s. So this is archaeology. So you take a, a, a cube, a portion of a representative portion of the universe, and you ask the question: If I have some initial fluctuations, absolutely tiny, and I turn on gravity, does this have a chance to do something that looks like our universe? That's the basic idea. So watch it. Watch gravity at work, and you see that there were tiny fluctuations. And what you see is every part that was a little bit under dense is being evacuated at the benefit of the denser part, which are attracting everything. So the rich get richer. Simple, right? So I'm just doing it again, so, so that you train your eye. So here we have something where we can imagine that we start from a quasi-homogeneous universe, just with tiny fluctuations, and just let gravity do its work and see whether there is anything that looks like what we observe. Well, look at it. Now, the, I, this was just a small slice in the simulation box that I, I mean, of course, you do the full box, and this is actually representative of the full universe. And so now you can ask the question. You have, you have a, a part of the universe in a box, and you can do extract observations like you do with, with a telescope. And so you can ask, how, how well does it do? Well, this is a very famous plot done in 2006, a little later. This is real data. This is actually, you saw a piece of it earlier, I mean, the Great Wall and so on. And here is simulated data. Well, I mean, you can apply a lot of math tools to, of course, go further than the visual impression, you know, fractal dimensions, correlations functions of various orders. There, I mean, we, the cosmologists, have been working on this for decades, trying to, you know, being able to tell the difference, to see whether this was a proper rendition. The short story is that on these large scales, provided, there is a little bit provided, provided you set the initial conditions properly, you get something that is indi barely indistinguishable from the real universe. Now, so, Okay, so we need to have seeds of certain shape, but the, sh the seeds to grow that structure, so these little fluctuations around uh, the essentially homogeneous universe, it's not like painting things where they would be. It's actually drawing, drawing like rolling the dice in a particular way. It's just like having a dice that is slightly off. But this is still what we call a ro random field. So it's just something that has nothing to do with all of these funny and interesting properties that we observe. It's something that is realized in nature very commonly. So what I'm saying is that we have something that cannot happen at random, but we found that if we have something that can be a random field, like throw of dice, and we apply gravity to it, we can reproduce what we see. And it's not only reproducing, because we can also be predictive. Because we're, for, for this scenario to work, it, it needs to work at every time. And so you can predict observations well before they are made, and then confront with, you know, well, the simulations and so on. And that's why, you know, I'm giving you the success story at the end. When we were in the 80s, there were lots of different ways of attempts, and we killed many of them doing this kind of work. We actually look at things based on neutrinos, all kinds of stuff, and we found that this was not working. But this is working. Okay, now let's move on. So we've seen this, and I've told you that this is actually, you know, something where it's a little bit of a time machine, but we can ask a further question. How far can we see? Looks like a simple question, right? But you know, are galaxies covering the sky? Well, no. Because if they were covering the sky, this is a well-known thing called Albert's paradox. It would have the brightness of a galaxy everywhere, and essentially it would look like the sun everywhere. So clearly this is not true. Well, how come? Well, part of the answer is the universe is expanding, but the other big part of the answer is stars were not there forever. There was a time where stars were created, galaxies were created. So you cannot propagate by thought all the way to infinity. I mean, there is a time when there is no more stuff because it's not formed yet. But you might still ask the question, how far can I go? 
Well, the answer is given. It's uh, you can go all the way to 13.8 billion years ago. And if you think, so now let's pause for a second. We, we've imagined that we are in an expanding universe, right? I mean, you, you've, you've seen that picture. Now think of moving, the, and, and you know that structures develop during that process under the influence of gravity. So now let's turn the movie backward. So you think you go back in time, everything is a little bit denser, all distances are a bit smaller, but everything is a bit less evolved, right? Because <laughs> structures that didn't have the time to be created. So let's keep doing this. Let's keep doing this for 13.8 billion years. We arrive at a time where no structure had form, and the universe was such a hot and such a dense place that it was also very hot. And it was not, the matter was not in the form it is today, where it's essentially formed of atoms. Actually, atoms were actually ionized. And ionized means the electrons were separated from the protons in the center. Okay? So you had a gas. At that time, the universe was essentially a very simple beast. It was essentially protons, electrons, and photons. Okay? So protons make the bulk of the mass, electrons annihilate the, the, the charge, so it's essentially neutral, and photons are the light carrier, and electromagnetism also, but I'm not going to get into this. So, so when we turn the movie backward, we go back to a time when the universe is hot, dense, and essentially homogeneous. Well, if you think of this, this is very much akin to the interior of the sun. It's hot, it's dense, and it's relatively homogeneous. Uh, now, light doesn't propagate inside the sun very far. And this is very simple because, because electrons uh, interact with photons. So every time there is a, a free electron and a photon, and I'll get, I'll get to show you something, I think. Yes. So. So suppose we are in this early phase of the universe. And so you see, I've, I coded the proton by a red dot, the electron by a blue dot, and the photon by a green trajectory. And you see that the, uh, the photons are interacting only uh, with the electron. And that's like a cosmic billiard. OK, so they keep happening, interacting with each other. And there is only for a very long time. And there are many, 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 many uh, photons, okay? And for a very long time in the early universe, not much happens. It's just expanding, diluting, and this image is just an expanded image of this one. But statistically, this is the same thing. Now, if we do this, if we keep doing this, this expansion for a very long time, well, everything gets colder. You know, when you expand, like, like when you expand air, uh, things get colder. So what happens is at some point, the, the photons might start have not having enough energy to break any atom that we'd like to form. So what happens is there will be seeds, a few atoms will start being made. You know, electrons will be in orbit, quote unquote, I mean, creating atoms, regular atoms of hydrogen. And so what will happen is essentially, well, not much, Apart from one little detail, of course, you are removing some of the electrons, so there a number of the diffusion center are going away. So that what we call the mean free path, the distance between two interactions, are, is increasing a bit. And you keep doing this, and at some point, essentially, all the universe is neutral, so there are no more interaction, no more billiard. The universe has turned transparent. And from now on, Till now, for the next 13 billion years, the photons travel essentially with no interaction whatsoever with anything. Well, but for one in a million. So it's either e simple enough for you to think the universe is transparent for the 13.8 billion years, and they are just propagating freely in every direction. OK, so now I can go back. Oops. Before I do this. So now I'll. This is actually how far I can go. 
it's I can my I can imagine I, I photons from further away, I cannot go any further than this period where the universe became transparent. Because further away, that's the universe is so dense that this is opaque and, it and this is this plasma where photons interact with electrons. So you cannot see further. So this is the ultimate bound forever for all sentient beings ever. They will never be able to see any further with photons. There might be other particles, like gravitons, but... So this is the ultimate horizon. And so you can speak of the observable universe because you cannot observe, at least with photons, any further than this. So we have a finite observable universe. Of course, this is a big playground. I and mean, this playground is so large that it takes 13.8 billion years to come from one side to the center. So it's, it's a big playground. Now, as I told you, uh, now let's go further. So we are in this bath of photons. And all of these photons are happily around. There are a lot of them. There are 400 per cubic centimeter all over the universe. And it's actually, so you can, if you detune uh, a, a TV set in the old days, before this was all electronic, you could see some of them being actually the photons of the, ba of the microwave background. By the way, this light that emitted, that was last, these photons that interacted for the last time, 13.8 billion years ago, are now um, peaking. Most of them are in the radio range. Just because the universe has expanded, so now their energy has weakened too, and they appear essentially around 100 gigahertz, or otherwise a, a wavelength of 3 millimeter. So, and by the way, the, the photons that we, that the astronomers are doing their business, my colleagues, uh, is, is essentially, they are essentially none. They are just those created by the stars. It's nothing as compared to the photons of the Big Bang. So most of the photons, more than 99%, are actually photons of the early universe that didn't interact at all with anything for essentially all the age of the universe. Okay. So if we can measure that radiation, we can actually see that apart from the galaxies in between, we should actually see, literally see that surface when the universe became from, the surface to us, when the universe became from opaque to transparent. Now, you have to think of something else. I told you, the further away we go, of course, the structures are less pronounced. And we think that actually the process that generating these initial conditions, these seeds, these small fluctuations, arose even before the universe became transparent. So we think that already at that time, they were the seeds of the galaxies, of the stars, of us, of everything. We believe that they were already the seeds and that they actually imprinted their presence on the light that is being coming from there. And here, it's exactly the same. It's, it's, it's a very good analogy with the sun. This is the surface of the sun. You see some stuff on the surface, okay? And that stuff on the surface translates what are the inner conditions that you cannot see inside the sun. Inside, it's opaque, as I told you. It's hot. It's dense, photons cannot travel very much, but they do have a little bit of structure, and that, by studying the surface of the sun, we get to know something about the inner part of the sun. Well, the only difference here is we are inside. So to us, it's more of something like this. These are the galaxies we observe, we are here. This is what I showed you initially, the large-scale structures, you know, this funny distribution of galaxies. And this is the sphere. And what I'm telling you is that we should see not only all of the, most of the photons of the universe coming from there, but I should also see some tiny fluctuations, which are the trace of everything that is, will become complexity, including us. OK, so that's pretty cool. So now let's uh, recap one more thing. I told you we believe that the, 
uh, seeds were made earlier. Well, we have very good reasons why they could be happening before that last scattering surface, uh, because there are energy considerations and so on. I'm not going to get into this. But so, uh, for a very long time, at least pre the 80s, uh, we had, we, uh, the, the theorists, uh, had to sort of put by hand the initial conditions. We were sort of say, well, okay, laws of nature are usually don't have much a scale. I don't know whether there is any specific phenomena. So we just assume essentially a scale-free, so something that is the same on every scale. And that was actually a very good assumption. It's not quite right, as we will see. But, you know, and so we were doing the calculation. I mean, the community was doing the calculation on that basis, starting with an assumption, and then enrolling the process, all the physics and so on, to see how we would get to where, you know, what we observe. Now, this still had a few annoying problems um, because it had, and those, when this was analyzed, they all came to the wedding of our two premier theory, which are general relativity and quantum mechanics. These are the two, the two ones that count for many, uh, for most of cosmology on the large scales and so on. And um, these two theories have been amazingly successful in their own realm. I mean, quantum mechanics, you know, I mean, everybody has a portable phone, transistors, everything. GR is a thing that, ele general relativity, sorry, that we've been celebrating the 100 years of not so long ago, including here uh, in Bangalore. Um, GR is the tool, the intellectual tool that enable us to think about the universe in a consistent way. No cosmology would have been possible without GR. Or at least we would have stuck to, to Newtonian cosmology, to be more precise. But when we did the wedding, we looked at what these two theories, uh, what happened in the early universe. Usually these two theories live in different realms. Quantum mechanics is a super small and super energetic, and gravity is actually weak energies and super large scales. So usually they don't meet, and all of quantum mechanics is usually done by just neglecting the influence of gravity, which is fine for, for, for everyday life. But when you look at the early universe, I told you, I mean, you know, you, you, you concentrate all this mass into small volumes. So you are in a place where gravity is strong and quantum mechanics. Okay, so there is fortunately a one regime where we don't need to have quantum gravity. That is a full theory because that one we don't have yet. But we can still understand pretty much what's some of the things that happen. And we realized that there were some annoying th factors when we were trying to put them together in the context of the early universe. I'll just, I don't want to get trapped into doing this for too long, so I'm just saying that one of the examples is that you expect to see some stuff, which are called monopoles, which would naturally be plenty uh, if under the usual hot Big Bang theory that I've been describing till now. And there are none, apart from one seen by Mr. Cabrera, maybe. So, so th there was a problem. And so the idea came at the end of the 70s that maybe there had been a period of exponential expansion. Exponential means extremely fast. And uh, it was realized that this could happen if there was a, p a period in the history of the universe where essentially the energy of the vacuum, the vacuum of the physicist, which is not the nothingness, I mean, this is something that is full of energy, was actually dominating. So now you have to think, oh, maybe even earlier than what I told you, the protons, the photons, and the electrons, there were a period that was something that was even before that, even before matter, even before radiation, there was vacuum. But the vacuum of the physicist, which has physical properties, and one of them is um, it can, if it's dominating what is happening in the universe, it's actually creating an a very fast expansion. And that suddenly, when it was realized that if there was that period, all of these problems were going away. Okay, so I'm not gonna go any further. 
But then something that appears around the beginning of the 80s, it was realized that vacuum of the physicist has quantum fluctuations, something that you cannot prevent. That is, there are always some variations of density, of energy, and so on. It's something that happens in any system. It cannot be present, prevented. And some guys had the idea to sort of say, well, what is happening to these tiny fluctuations during this phase of expansion? And it was realized that it could be actually the seed of everything we see. It had the proper properties, and it made a further predictions. Among other things, it made one key prediction, and we have been after it since then, is that, okay, but if there is this phase of expansion, then it, it needs to end at some point. So this should be reflected in the fact that all fluctuations shouldn't be born exactly equal. There should be a tiny deviation as compared to this. We found this. Okay, we demonstrated it. So I'll tell you this a little while. In, I mean, and there were some hints from the previous satellite, by in including Lyman Page, which was described, but we actually nailed it. And I'm going to tell you how we did this. So let me sort of recap there. So when you have this relatively simple ID, well, of course, you cannot stop at this ID. You, do, you need to do the math and so on. And you find that there are lots of predictions that arise and that you need to go as physicists to sort of see, well, I mean, is it a good theory? Is it predictive? OK. So, to, so that you can sort of visualize, usually it doesn't work when I'm doing this. So quantum fluctuation of the vacuum is something like this, right? I mean, these are actually quantum calculations, microscopic, so that you can sort of visualize. You see, I mean, this is just like bubbling tea or coffee, depending on, well, you know. So, it, it, but you imagine you have these fluctuations, you put it into an expansion, and now you have fluctuations like this on essentially every scale, but not quite. Okay, so next, well, I mean, next is we do what we do on the theory side, that is we compute uh, possible imprint, how the sky would look like. And this, are, I remind you, no CMB photon had been detected at that time of this calculation. Okay, we, we are before uh, even the detection of this microwave background and before the, but calculations were done were to sort of say, well, all right, let's think of this seriously. So depending, now we have all of the ingredients and you do too. So we suppose we have a mechanism that a mechanism took place that generated fluctuations. We know how to propagate everything forward because it's essentially you know, a relatively simple universe. So vacuum gives rise to matter and radiation, and these fluctuations are ultimately being gathered by gravity and will ultimately form stars and us. So they must be present in some form when the universe becomes transparent, these sort of balls that I showed you, which is the furthest we can see. And so this was computed by theorists under different assumptions about how inflation happened, what is the content of the universe, how fast it's expanding, because all of this controls, in a way that we can quantify with equations, the exact appearance of these little imprints. And I showed you here uh, two cases of how the sky may look like according to different theories of the growth of complexity. Okay? So, everything I said so far is essentially can be seen as this. There is a period very, very early on, the first billions of a billions of a billions of a second. So this is pretty early. Then there is not much where matter and, and the radiation are created. There is this plasma that I told you about where uh, you know, these fluctuations are there. It the universe becomes transparent. This is about 380,000 years. Uh, and uh, that is 13.8 billion years ago. Then it takes another 200 million years, roughly, for the first stars to be created. And then, well, we get to the universe we know, populated uh, with galaxies, which are of all kinds and shapes and so on, which we observe, and which have this funny distribution. Now, this is a godlike vision. I mean, it sort of gives the impression that we can be outside of time and universe and we're just watching it. This is not our observable universe. 
our observable universe is this one. We are somewhere. Around us, we see our galaxy. Okay, we are embedded in the galaxy. Then when we look further away, we see the distribution of galaxies, but as you can see, these are just extracted from the previous simulation. You can sort of see we're looking at structures less and less structured, less and less evolved with time, till we hit you know, this thing where before any, before any stars, which was 200 million years after this, um, where we see the imprint of the seeds on the large scale structure. And this is like the surface of the sun. It tells us about what happened earlier in the first billions of a billions of a billions of a second, what I call inflation. So this is the sort of easy way to think of it, like, uh, you know, you have this thing, but that's, that's godlike. What we are actually, we are in the universe and we're using our time machine to look really far away and really early in the history of time. Okay, so this was pretty much a condensed course of, cosmo of modern cosmology. You've got it all. So all of this was very, not devoid of observations, but um, I had to use a lot of uh, argument of authority where you had to trust me. Now, let's talk about observing this microwave background. So first of all, 1978, Penzias and Wilson, Bell Labs, near Princeton, they find that there is some funny radiation at one frequency that seems to be homogeneous. So essentially, the sky looks like a completely homogeneous slate, apart from, well, what is in the galaxy, but you remove that. But okay, they didn't know, but then further observations convinced us that this had a specific shape in terms of energy distribution of what you expect for thermal radiation that was in equilibrium with the rest of the universe. So this was big and led to the Nobel Prize in 1978. Now, there were a lot of ground experiments, but the next big thing is the COBE satellite. And COBE satellite did, had three experiments, and two really made history. One made, a, which is called FIROS, which is still the very best measurement we have till today about the distribution of energy of this uh, microwave background, that is this homogeneous thing in, around us. And it showed that this was a perfect black body as expected in the physics books. And that was really the turning point in cosmology between different alternative that has been proposed for modeling the universe. And that's sort of the community switch and sort of say, yes, this is a hot big bang. This is a useful model to describe what's there. But there was another experiment called DMR, which is here, and differential microwave radiometer, which actually made also a map of the distribution. And it was not quite homogeneous. And what they found is if you increase the contrast by a factor of a thousand, you obtain something where you see the galaxy like this, some distribution where it's hotter in one sense. Um, hot is blue usually, and cold is red. Yes, I know this is a little bit surprising, but that's reality. But then, when you remove this sort of large-scale component of red-blue, you find this. This is a galactic plane, oops, and that was the very first measurement of this imprint of the primordial seed. Now it was found, at last. And so that was the beginning of a new era, I mean completely, because now we knew that all of this theoretical thing that I told you about, well, was actually anchored in reality. We could see with very low angular resolution, with very high level of noise, but we knew that the seeds were there at a level that was appropriate to be able to generate the stars and the galaxy and so on. Okay? So next, well, there were quite a flurry of ground experiments, in particular at the South Pole, and uh, there were these balloons that made the uh, perfect round around the South Pole and started to make a very tiny map, you know, of in one area, but this one had, I don't want to get into the detail, but this one had, you know, angular, res you could see f finer detail in the angular distribution, and it was higher signal to noise. And so you could see, you could reveal some further properties of these initial seeds. Then there was a WMAP satellite, which were, we actually proposed uh, at the same time WMAP and Planck. 
Okay, but WMAP uh, went for a quick shot, go fast for space. Okay, so even though we started at the same time, uh, they had their results much earlier than us. And we actually, we in Europe, and I was one of the proposers, we decided to go for the full thing and we'll say, we'll do the full job. No quick and dirty. We want to do extract all of the information that there is in the anisotropies, and that's the beginning of Planck. So, Planck. So it was after three years of study, because we started to propose this as soon as the COBE result, as soon as the detection was made, we immediately went out and proposed to the ESA to sort of say, we want to build the full thing, the thing that will do the job, once and for all. So to make the ultimate map of the temperature and isotropies, which required, of course, technological breakthroughs because no one on the planet could actually had the technology to actually do what was needed to, for this ambitious goal. So of course, it took longer, and, and that was understood from start. So here is Planck, here's the machine, our time machine that we built uh, in Europe. And so you see this is like four meter by four meter, uh, lots of uh, things complicated, about two tons, two instruments. The mirror here uh, is about in that direction, 1.5 meter. And if you look at the math that provides you with the right angular resolution so that you can exactly see all of the details there are to see in the cosmic microwave background. And so here is the machine. I mean, at the center, you have bolometers. And bolometers are tiny little pieces which are actually taking the photon flux. And when they receive uh, more flux, it gets heat up. And there is a little thermometer on the top of it. And, so you tr and then the tr thermometer is read off. And so you are transforming the incoming flux of photons into an electrical signal. OK. This had never been used in space before. But it had the potential of being revolutionary because it's a running theme. I mean, of course, to, for great advances, you also need great technological advances. I mean, that goes together. We are not only progressing by theory. And so there is a little, bit, a little catch. Is for these sort of super-duper uh, thermometers, they need to be really cold to be able to give you the sensitivity you need. Actually, they need to be at a tenth of a degree of the absolute zero, which is 0.1 Kelvin, or minus 2.273 degrees. So, and that had never been done in space either. So we said we will build a machine that would be the coldest spot known in the universe at 0.1 K, that is one tenth of the absolute zero, and operate for quite a while. And of course, by doing this, we'll put these small detectors which, by the way, are used by every ensuing CMB experiment. And so this is a machine, this is about that size. It's the core, this is our instrument, the high-frequency instrument aboard the satellite. And I'm going to just walk you through, essentially, how the satellite is built. Uh, can it so, yes, around is ad additional detectors from another instrument that is covering the low frequencies. So this is at the very center of what is called the focal plane. And all the warm electronics is sent away in the back. So this is separated by what is called V-groove, which separates the cold part from the hot part in the bottom. And so it's colder and colder when you go on the top. And then you see all of the electronic chain, uh, and well, cooling chain there. And you see some fluids that are going there. They are cooling the thing to first 4K. Um, and then send it back, so it's actually pretty complicated. And then you have another machine that will appear. OK, so this one will bring, well, sorry, the, the previous one was bringing a 20K, then to 4K. And then the most, so this is the 4K part. And then here you will see soon appearing helium-3 and helium-4 tanks, which mix will actually create the 0.1K inside the core of this. OK, so this is a big, complicated cooling machine. So it radiatively cools it away to about 40K. And then uh, you have all these stages to bring the Nortex to 0.1K inside there. And then the rest is essentially supporting electronics, uh, how you steer the thing, how you, you know, I mean, all of this is, so all of this is sort of a satellite in the, uh, in the bottom. And of course, you 
the sun will be there, so they, this is our uh, solar panels, and then there will be an antenna that will send things to Earth. And then on the top, this is a secondary mirror, the primary mirror, and there, there is a baffle to uh, shield away radiation, and here it is. Okay, so this is a machine. So that, so the principle of the machine is actually pretty simple, if you bear with me. It's a, a glorified thermometer that is reacting to how many heat is deposited by photons that last interacting with matter 13.8 billion years ago. So they've been propagating happily, then they get into one of those tubes, and the fluctuations of the number, depending on where you look, changes the amount of heat deposited that we actually measure. And for this to work, you have to be able to point this, of course, but you also have to bring it to 0.1K. Okay, so here is the real thing, okay? And as is seen, at that time, I had been working for 16 years of this, and by that time, WMAP was having results. So that was actually a little bit annoying because people that start actually slightly after you uh, are, you know, getting the great news, uh, you know, they're unraveling the universe and so on, and you say, well, are there going to be anything left for me? Uh, fortunately, the universe has plenty. And uh, WMAP fortunately only scrapped the surface, so we had plenty, and I'll tell you in particular the one thing about inflation. So here is a time of the launch, 2009. Uh, so we've been uh, amazingly lucky, by the way, in this community, so that we had a stream of results between the ground and the various satellites uh, in various period of time. So that kept us busy all the time and with, with you know, really great excitement all the time. So let me also... So I showed you the when with this. So yes, I didn't put this on. The, the thing that is amusing when you are there, of course I was there, is when you hear this thing starting, okay, you have like uh, 220 tons of powder that is essentially in a controlled explosion with your baby on the top, okay? It's, it's, and you hear the, the, the sound wave propagating all the way to you and boom! I mean, that's just a life-changing experience. <laughs> Uh, and in the good way, because it actually flew properly and went in the right direction, uh, even though for a while I was wondering whether it was not going completely wrong, and I stopped breathing, and I nearly fainted, till the point I had to realize that maybe breathing was good. I still needed to be able to do this a little longer. So, there were two on this Ariane 5 from the, uh, French, from the French space bases in Kourou, which is now the ESA bases. Um, so on the top, there were two satellites, Herschel and Planck. Okay, so Herschel is a, is a brother or sister satellite that did other things that are having to do with the galaxy formation. But then the next thing was, okay, in route to the L2 point, so this is the sun, this is the earth, this is the moon around, and we go to this point where between the tendency to go straight, okay, due, due to the inertia, and the, attract, the combined attraction to the sun and the earth, this is a metastable point. So it just goes around nicely with the earth around the sun. And so you can be around there and you look at the cosmos in that direction and you go around, around the sun by doing this. So you go to L2, 1.5 million kilometer away from us. Okay, and so, yes. And so you see the Planck orbit here we were not the first there. WMAP was there first. Okay, so here, here it is. So you send the thing there, and then it turns cold, and uh, in the end, you can happily start uh, scanning the cosmos. And what you see is, is what you do is you, you, you get the photons coming from, the, from really <laughs> the far end of the universe all the way to the telescope, secondary, to the focal plane, you register the variations. So what you have is a timeline of signal, right? I mean, when you look in that direction, you, you sort of see as a function of time what is coming. And then by using the pointing information, you can tell what was the signal that was coming from which direction, and out of this, you can build a map. So you essentially, by doing this, you actually do it several times. You map the cosmos and you map it in different frequencies so that you'll be able to, to know what is coming from around you 
and say our galaxy and what is coming from you know the furthest regions so this is how it looks in uh in 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 frequencies which are meant to show well this is a galactic plane and so on and that shows that there is dust and so on that has to be taken care of okay uh uh, no, I just want... Okay, so the success of Planck is essentially there. Uh, what it shows you is inside these bolometers here, the curve is written here, okay? So this is, this is 90 days after launch till the time when there was no more coolant refrigerant, if you want, on board, okay? So you see 900 days, perfect, cool, no one, no telephones, no, no nothing just the cosmos and you, which is a pretty cool place. And now look at this. I mean, this is 0.1K, so one-tenth of the absolute zero. But the most amazing is look at this. There is 0.1 milliK on, on this scale. And you can see that the bolometer plate has been saying within 0.1 milliK of the temperature of 0.1K. That's very important. That stability is actually crucial because what you are trying to do is seeing the variations in the incoming flux, how much heat, so what is the variation of temperature that you get when you're looking in different directions. So if now your satellite is just going all over the place with variations of temperature, you cannot measure anything. So it has to be dead stable. And so that's it. You see it. We stayed for 900 days at 0.1K within 0.1 milliK of accuracy. So with this, when things work, you get some pretty damn good data, and you'll be able to do things that nobody has been able to do before. So I built a computing center at the bottom of my institute, uh, which at the time was one of the top 500 in the world. So just dedicated to this experiment. And that's what we did. So here is the primary result of Planck. So these are, I remind you, this is a full sphere. Right, each of these. This is a galactic plane, this is a galactic center. And why do you see nine? Because we're looking in slightly different frequencies, in different wavelengths, if you wish, which is what we're, we're looking at slightly different band passes, or colors, if you wish. And the idea is that different emission mechanism emit differently with different strength in different bands. So for instance, the synchrotron radiation of our galaxy is very strong at low frequencies. But when you go down, it's sort of, you see, this is less, less powerful, okay? You see something th that is the same everywhere in the back. These are the fluctuations of the background. This is what we're after, the background fluctuations of the cosmic light. But before that, you have to clean all the stuff that is in between. Because yes, all of those photons the immense majority of them are coming to us unimpeded. But there are a few photons that are being added, like those emitted by our galaxies that we have to account for. We have to remove that. The way we do this is precisely look at the signature of this different emitting mechanism to be able to tame them. And this is, for instance, this is an emission of the dust of our own galaxy. So you need to clean that up too. And you see the top of the, the most of the emission is around, around 100 gigahertz. Well, most of the signal is coming from here. That's where the cosmic microwave background is the most intense. By the way, WMAP couldn't see anything further. It couldn't access to any of this. So WMAP was totally blind of what was happening on the high frequency side. So we had to guess as a community what was the dust doing. OK, but that's normal. You have, oops, sorry. Uh, by the way, you can sort of see, for instance here, there is a number which is really telling. 0.5 micro K degree. Well, what does it tell you? It tells you that if I have a pixel with degree, with, with size, linear size is one degree, the, R, the, the random fluctuations of detector noise is 0.5 millionth of a degree. Okay, so one over a million. It's a pretty small number. So it means that what we see here, we can see fluctuations of a few millionth of a degree in the back. And that's what it takes, because these seeds, of the, the primordial seeds from which we come, are actually tiny. 
there are you know one part in 10 10,000 typically so what you need to be able is to do a measurement with, which is at the level of the micro Kelvin micro millionth of a degree precision that's what Planck delivers it delivers the frequency coverage full sky but it's also the angular resolution and the sensitivity that is a completely unique combination that allowed us to do the full job which is to sort of say we've extracted all the information typically that there is from the temperature and isotropies it's not to say that there are no further things to learn about the universe I'll get back to this and maybe India will take a big part in the next step so but for this this is pretty much the end of the story so we have to cope with this bear with me a little bit longer but this is going to be rewarding well you can always stop me if you want to I mean that's but don't throw really bad things not hard things okay so I told you we want to look at the background radiation we have a mission from our own galaxy we have also you know the other galaxies after all we started from there so each of these little points are emitting sufficiently we have to remove them one by one and we have also clusters of galaxies that are bolts of gas which this guy is is is, is a specialist so uh, we have also to cope with that so you have all of these foregrounds and that's a problem which is very well known in applied math this is called the cocktail party problem and you know it so happens sometimes you are in a party and there is a group and sometimes there is one person in particular you'd like to hear more than others okay so well the way we do this typically is we put several mics and by using you know the the different rendition of the con various conversation in the different mics we can isolate that particular conversation and we can actually tune and listen to several conversation differently our brain is doing this in a completely amazing fashion well of course I mean we're not using exactly our brain and the detectors for us each of those is one of the map it's a response at one part in one particular band one particular color and now we can play the game of using all of them which are like microphone if you wish I mean the analogy to extract the part which is genuinely this specific one which is going from the back and we're using pretty advanced mathematical tools and we've actually advanced the field in doing this I mean we collaborated with applied mathematicians so another little signal these kind of things take a lot of different profiles engineers mathematicians theoreticians instrumentalists and instrumentalists in the thermal electrical cryogenic all of these things and you have to and steering herding these cats together for a very long period is actually also is something um, interesting it was a, an experience of my life anyway so one day uh, and that was uh, March 2013 we finally announced uh, our release and unveiled the you know rendition of the cosmic microwave bag one once you peeled everything else uh, it did it was not unnoticed in the world uh, and uh, for a scientist making the, the headlines of the New York Times, I mean that's something and for a French scientist in addition I'm not from the US I mean <laughs> you have to realize so from the US perspective I'm as much backwaters as you guys yeah I mean that's just so that was actually a very good feeling <laughs> anyway um, even you know lots of people I don't know if you know this white guy but you know his other <laughs> uh you know it was noticed by a lot of people anyway so here is a final release that we just released um, uh, well six months ago in uh at the cospar meeting in july so here is the final map what is shown here is that you know we are not doing cosmology in any part of this gray area because this is right behind the galaxy so this is it's too hard to control at the proper level so all cosmology is done in these outer parts here and there are a few regions that we have to excise and what you see here is the scale is 300 minus to plus 300 micro Kelvin the root mean square that is the typical size of the fluctuations is 100 micro Kelvin and to get all of the details you have to be able to resolve the difference of the micro Kelvin level so that's why you needed to have all of this machinery to be able to get to this uh, sensitivity once you've taken care of everything else now there is a final thing if you want to bear with me a little bit longer is how we now connect 
this map, which is actually, you know, well, actually, this is just, okay, I mean, it doesn't look like anything, just, just bumps and wiggles. And so how do we connect to theory? After all, I've been announcing that we'll be, you know, connecting with deep questions of the universe. So for now, what I've done is to tell you that this part is resulting from the early, very early uh, uh, evolution of the universe, and that is essentially this image was imprinted 13.8 billion years ago, and there is no change since then. So I'm just looking at this baby universe, its imprint. But now, how do I turn into physics? Well, so we have to do something, and um, I'm going to use an image here for a second. Is suppose you have a satellite that has mapped the the um, the sea the sea heights. Okay, so you look at the waves from above, and you can make a map. You make an instantaneous map, say of of the Atlantic or the Pacific, whatever. So you know you map the heights. So some places you have a wave, and then you have a trough, and then and so on. Well. You can make this map, but you cannot do anything with it. I mean, you have a picture. Now, what is of interest is to sort of say, well, OK, when I'm looking at waves of this side, what is a typical height? And what is a typical height of waves a little bit less? So you are not asking a detailed question. You are asking what is called a statistical question. On average, the waves of that size have what height? Well, this can be done with a mathematical transformation that is you look, you put the frequency of the wave and you put the typical height of the waves here. Okay? That is something that the theorists can deal with. We can make a prediction on average in a particular universe with a particular recipe, particular seeds, particular content, particular expansion rate, how this curve would, would look like. This is es essentially what theorists have been up to. That is to say, well, of course, we cannot predict the particular location in the universe we are at large. The only thing we can connect with are typical properties. So, ah, it's interesting. The most important plot is actually not showing. <laughs> it's actually very amusing. Oh, no, I know. Well, yeah, I'm going to drop this one. Okay. Um, so, what I was just saying is, is this cosmic imprints. That is, you can look at this curve, and theorists have been turning the crank, and these curves, okay, which is frequency of the waves, or you know, separation on the map, as compared to the typical height. So this is the image is pretty good. You know, depending on how much stuff, what is expansion rate, what are the initial conditions, it looks different. So this is really the fingerprint of the universe. So now think of what we are doing. We have theorists that are constructing an atlas of potential universe of imprints. And now we have the culprit, the real universe. So what are we going to do next? Well, we'll take the fingerprint of the real universe and look in the atlas. Is there any correspondence? It might be that the, universe, that the theory has got it all wrong. There is no match. Could very well be. I mean, there is no guarantee when you do this that we got it right. You could also have an opposite thing, which is, oh, Actually, all the universe we can think of has essentially the same signature. We are not learning very much. Or you can be in a situation where actually there's only a tiny fraction of all possible universe that correspond, given the noise and so on, to the particular imprint. So now let's play that game together. So here is the curve. This is the real one from the real universe. And you see there are actually error bars there. So it's really saying that for some scales, the, you know, the, 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 the variations of temperature is a bit higher on a particular scale, and then it goes down, and then it's a little bit higher again on, on the slightly smaller scales, and so on. So that is the universe fingerprint. It's telling us how much power there was in the initial conditions as transformed by the early evolution at this early stage. And now we can confront, and what is the best match we have? This is one of those theoretical universes that is there. And this universe has only six parameters to describe all of it. And you see, this is an amazingly good fit. I mean, it's perfect, essentially. And this model depends, is actually saying that the universe can be described with a handful of numbers, which are very small, which is just very small. It's essentially stuff, how much normal stuff there is, how much matter of different types, 
and then something that tells about the property of the initial conditions, what I call inflation. And some number, in particular, that tells whether things were the same on every scale or slightly tilted so that inflation could end. This is a thing we have been, and the prediction from the 80s was this number is not exactly won by a few percent. So we were after finding a few percent difference as compared to one of this number, which is essentially a slope. So, but for the time being, the thing is, okay, we have this small number of theorems, and they allow us to describe all these initial conditions, well, the, the imprint, and then we know that with this imprint, we actually generate the, the large-scale structure that we see. So I want to stop this. So tell me about compression for a second. So Planck gathered about 100 billion samples, time samples. So that's all the bits that we transmitted to the ground and sent to the computer I showed you in the, in the, uh, uh, in the basement of my institute. Out of this was extracted, uh, because this is highly redundant, we're making many measurements to decrease the noise and check that, they are, that the results are consistent with each other. We extracted like a one billion pixel values, which is we measured not only the intensity, but some other properties that I will not talk about, which is the polarization of the light. And then we did this at several frequencies, and every map has about 50 million pixels. So altogether, we had a billion pixel values. Out of those, that's a component separation, we extracted that map that I showed you, which is about 100 million uh, pixels. So it's just like a super duper, you know, photograph, an expensive one for that matter. Out of this, we extracted the power, that is how much power on different scales. This is this wiggle lines that I showed you, which is, you know, maybe 10,000 numbers. And these 10,000 numbers where their statistical description can all be fit with just six parameters of a, of, a, of a model of the universe. And maybe even more importantly is this, no significant evidence of a seventh. Of course, I mean, you know, we can always bring in some fairy tooth. I mean, theorists are very good at producing some additional potential stuff. And this will change slightly things. And so we can actually go and check whether there is an imprint of any of these small deviations. And we see no trace whatsoever. And so we have amazingly just in addition to the great success of this particular model, is also imprinted the fact that this is also a great killer, the, the greatest killer of all, because it's, it's, a, it's a theory killer of, of many, many different things that didn't happen, that you can constrain very well, because otherwise we would have seen it. So, okay. So imprinted, there are things like how much stuff there is. So that was the, one of the questions I started out, you know, by how much stuff there is and of different types and so on. And uh, uh, it's actually funny that uh, one of the big mystery that I will not talk about, because otherwise we'll spend the night together and maybe several nights, which actually I could speak for several nights, but uh, maybe, don't, maybe you can't stay. Um, the fact is, the normal stuff out of which we are made, that is, the protons, the electrons, and so on, is only a tiny fraction of the total. Most of the matter is actually what we call dark matter. And, well, so this is one of the surprises left for tomorrow, or for th the young people in the audience, uh, probably. So that's one thing we learn. There is another thing we, a we can ask. Well, you know, depending on the ge spatial geometry of the universe, you know, like, we can ask the question, um, can it be non-flat spatially? So a flat universe, you'd see the image of the microwave background in a certain way, right? I mean, that gives this particular image. Now, if you are a universe which has a lot more stuff that is curving the light rays, you would see something like this. I mean, you curve the light rays, so the map is actually, you know, like, it's like uh, the same map but extended. So you see that you apply a transformation to the image that, is, that reflects the overall geometry of the universe. You can also do this when this is sort of an underdense universe, and that's just the opposite transformation. Now, the thing is, our universe is quite precisely spatially flat. That is the good old Euclidean geometry for the space part. I'd be very clear, right? Um, but so it means that if you are taking your out sort of a 
problems with time and so on. And what we're really doing here is the equivalent of what you do with the triangle. And if it's on a flat surface, you see that the sum of the angles is 180 degrees. And if you're putting it, if you're trying to put it on a balloon, on the surface of a balloon, you have to sort of cut some stuff to be able to curve it. And you have to add some stuff to be able to be on the saddle. So we are out. And so, but to be able to do this precisely, we're doing it with the furthest object we can possibly have in the universe, which is the furthest we can ever get to, which is the last scattering surface from which this microwave background originates. And we have an amazingly precise answer. It's very precisely flat. Now, these are pretty cool, so that we can actually relate things that we've learned uh, when, we, when I was your age at school, you know, about geometry and so on, and apply this to our overall universe. And this is all based on physics. And I don't ask you to understand the details. But uh, what is important is that you actually grasp the procedure by which we operate. And there are lots of steps. But everybody can understand those steps, at least in principle. So this is not mysterious or magic. This is physics, even though that looks like magic sometimes. Now, let me, call to the let me get to the final point. So this curve is a result. I, I remind you, this curve is telling you the size of the fluctuations, the height, if you wish, on the last scattering surface. And this is just like we're looking at the surface of the sun. This is just a reflection of things that happened way earlier in the first billions of a billions of a second during an inflationary period, if it happened. And one of the key predictions, so we need to remove all the variations that are imprinted by the early evolution between the first 380,000 years to get to the properties of the initial conditions. It turns out that, one, the universe is very simple at that time. Fluctuations are tiny, meaning that we have all the math tools to be able to do this very precisely. And so we can extract from this what is the distribution of power there was in this very early phase as a function of scale. And what we find is if it was scale invariant, this would be a flat curve in this convention. We see this is clearly tilted. And this is clearly telling us that the, the properties of the, the seeds are completely consistent with what, are, what is needed for inflation to have not only happened, but also to have finished and result in transformation then at the end of inflation of matter and radiation. So the thing is, it took quite a while. I mean, Mukhanov and Chibisov, Mukhanov is still very well alive. I mean, this calculation of the first calculation of quantum fluctuation of the vacuum in this expanding phase is 1981. And it took all that time. Of course, we did a lot of things in between. We checked quite many other things. I mean, it's not the only result. But then that was sort of one of the coning achievements was to sort of say, well, yes, this is something that we expect since then to be able to see this deviation from scale invariance. And Planck, you can see the error bars. I mean, Planck has nailed it. There is just no question. Uh, and you can open the Pandora's box, uh, add neutrinos, all kinds of things. This is still very well determined. So this is at the very core uh, of what Planck did. Now, so I remind you what we're talking about is, you know, the relative amplitude of these fluctuations on various scales. And so we are not, you, you know that we, you've heard certainly that we are the children of the stars. Yes, we are. But the stars has to come from somewhere. And we are actually the children of the quantum fluctuations of the, <laughs> of the background. So we are literally children of the vacuum. I mean, isn't it amazing? I mean, I don't know, but I'm, I'm, I keep being amazed, even when I've been giving this talk a number of times. <laughs> now, we are actually even more ambitious than this. We, are, we would like to get even more. And we believe that during that phase, there were also some primordial gravitational waves that were emitted. Because in some sense, this quantum fluctuation of the background, which is like this boiling tea, well, that affects everything. That affects even the distance between objects and so on. So we do expect that there should be, at that time, some primordial gravitational waves, at least in many theories. This has an imprint also on the microwave background. And so 
yes, we've detected the gravitational waves, you know, in LIGO, Virgo, and so on. You heard Kip Thorne and so on. But these are just, uh, you know, regular objects, usual stuff, black holes, I mean, neutron stars. I'm talking about, you know, <laughs> the sound of the primordial universe. So that we haven't detected at all. So Planck has put some very good constraints, which are shown in this plot. You, you don't, I don't want to explain it. It will take too much time. But the point is, this is really something open to the future. We want to be able to build another machine, which would be like Planck, targeting at measuring another pr all the properties of this microwave background. But this time, not the temperature and isotropies, but the polarization and isotropies, which is, of course, much weaker. Of course, I mean, we've done the easy stuff. Your generation, at least the young parts, I mean, we'll have to do this. So that's one of the big things we want to go after. I want to reflect on one thing, which is shown in this graph, and I'll be pretty close to the end, is, uh, well, how much we've learned in all of this exercise. And so I've put the constraint by the detection at the number one here, that's Kobe. And I've asked, Okay, I'm looking at, you know, this theory has many parameters, well, has a number of parameters, and including some additional ones, like the red curve. And so I can ask the question, how much space in the, parameter of, in the space of parameters am I allowed? H how much can I wiggle around? H how, how uncertain things? So if things are very uncertain, I have a lot of space, that the data is just constraining me a little bit. And so I can actually compute, it's possible to sort of say, what an experiment has done in terms of reducing the uncertainty in the parameter space. Sometimes you have a paradigm change. That is, you have to change space. You, you, you forgot completely an element. That's wonderful, but it's not very common. But then you can still ask, well, you know, within a particular framework, how much do I reduce uncertainties? And this is sort of this uh, called the figure of merit. So if you take Kobe to be one, the first generation that I showed you briefly, which are the you know, showing the peak and so on, uh, maxima, boomerang, the thing that went around the pole. Okay, that increased things. It decreased the parameter space by m more than a factor of a thousand. It's pretty good. Then WMAP came in, and, well, I'm not, I didn't plot here all of the releases, but this is the final release of WMAP in 2013. So it kept, and now it's 10 to the 9 as compared to Kobe. We've reduced collectively the parameter space by a factor of a billion as compared to Kobe. And now it's Planck here, and depending on the model, you are in the 10 to the 15, 10 to the 16 range. Okay, so now it's, we're talking of close to a billion, billion times. So that's, so one thing you can see is this improvement has been very large, and this is like uh, we double our constraining power every six months. Right? I mean, Moore's is every 18 months. So we, we are, I mean, I'm talking serious business. In 26 years, we kept essentially doubling our overall accuracy uh, every six months. And there is no sign, because I've been, been involved in making calculations for the next generation sa satellite. I mean, essentially, this will keep going up with polarization. So we have still some more information to be grabbed. But anyway, so uh, you see sort of a success story that is in, in this thing where the detection first, I mean, which is really amazing, and then progressively we've been making finer and finer uh, measurement, learning things on the way by this decrease of uh, the uncertainties and so being able to answer some questions which the previous generation thought that was completely undoable. And now we can dream of the, of the future which uh, we'll continue, I'm sure. Um, well, let me skip this. Um, I want to conclude on this, because uh, that's actually... So the previous plot was just to say, well, all, all everything that we learn from the CMB is actually quite consistent with the other things that we've measured, the fact that there is the galaxy distribution, that we infer from clusters. So all of this makes for a grandiose viewpoint. But I want to get back to this lambda CDM parameter with this model that I've been telling you about, which is six parameters, which is completely ridiculously small. So it's amazing that we can describe so much with a parameter, with a model with so, so small number of parameters, 
and you know you have three to control um, the stuff there is in the universe one which is telling us when stars light and then two about the initial conditions now and and this is, is enough to lay down the groundwork for everything else all the way to the distribution of galaxies around us you have to realize so everything else is encoded in these six numbers or it has to be a deviation i'm not talking how we form the stars themselves because inside you have some other process to get in but all the large-scale structure the history of the universe is encoded in this and all the rest are derived quantities this is just amazing now I want to conclude on this, that this is deceptively simple. And why am I saying this? Because this is actually relying on our two main theories and far-reaching assumptions. One of them is GR, general relativity. General relativity was tested in the solar system. It's just, it's a tiny, ridiculously small scale. Now we are applying it to cosmic scales completely gigantic ones. There is no guarantee that there are no deviations from GR. I mean, this is just unbelievable. And still, we have the guts, well, collectively, humans, right? We have the guts, we say, well, let's assume that it still works on these cosmic scales, and let's compute, and let's make predictions, and compare to the fact, and it works at high level of precision. This is unbelievable. So. It's GR, it's also, well, it's quantum mechanics too, because it's quantum mechanics applied in an energy scale, which is completely undreamed of uh, on, on Earth. You cannot build an accelerator, even on the scale of the solar system. You would still be at tiny, ridiculously small energies as compared to the one involved here. So we're probing physics on scales, on domains of energy, of time, which are completely unheard of. And so we do this by sort of sticking to our guns of physicists. We say, well, let's try to do it anyway, and let's see where it, where it brings us. There is no guarantee to this. Why is the universe even understandable? So, but we keep trying. Now, uh, this model also is relying on a few things which are actually, well, there are several ways to describe it annoying opportunities for discovery whatever there are two things dark energy and dark matter which we have only faint ideas of and and faint is sometimes even an overstatement about what they are and so we are building satellites like the euclid satellite to be able to learn more about dark energy uh, we are building underground experiments we're doing all kinds of things but for now it's annoying our model is relying on something which we haven't measured yet, which we don't know. I mean, it's a, it's a fruitful hypothesis, which when you make it, allows to do you know, great success. But still, it's still something that we still have to nail. So it's, it's, I don't suddenly want to sound like this is the sound of, this is the end of cosmology or of anything. We're, we've just made a great step forward, but there are many other steps, so if you are younger in the audience, you should be uh, rather encouraged than, rather than discouraged, because there are lots to do. Um, and then, uh, well, let me skip this. And so I want to conclude on this. I think we've done our homework pretty well. Uh, it's been, by the way, we've been having some recognition for this. But we are left with the thing I was telling you. We have a very surprising mix or cocktail for our universe about what is this dark energy, dark matter. And then we have an effective theory for how seeds were laid, laid down initially. But that's just an effective theory. It's not connected with the rest of fundamental physics. There is a huge gap there. And so this gap needs to be filled and one of them is that one of the key could be the detection of primordial gravitational waves from that epoch. And that's one of the higher goals that we are setting ourselves uh, as a community, uh, as a goal. All right, so I'm done and probably very late. Yeah, by something like 30 minutes. Hmm. All right.
Well, you know, but no, but not that many went away, so that's pretty cool. <laughs> yeah, yeah, thank you very much for uh, taking us through this very exciting journey through, the, through our amazing universe. I hope you can take a few questions as well. Oh, yes. Yeah. Yes, so yes. Uh, if you have a question, please raise your hand so that uh, some of our volunteers will bring a mic to you. Okay, we have here one. And there are some questions that are passed uh, on to me. I'll, I'll read uh, uh, some of them as well. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you for a wonderful talk. Um, I just have a very simple question. So we read typically that the, the universe that we live in has been very fine-tuned, right? There are some six fundamental forces, and so if you look at the, the strong and the weak and the gravitational, etc. Um, is my understanding correct that your six parameters are even more fundamental and that they would lead to predictions of the strong and weak forces in the gravitational force? Not directly. I mean, yes, there are four fundamental forces, um, and uh, they are, in some sense, uh, th 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 these forces or the fields are actually the really fundamental content of the universe. Um, but we have to, I mean, physics is about not only about isolating these forces, but seeing how they operate together and, or, or single, and how you put them to work to, to predict things. So we are more measuring um, consequences of this. And so we are learning, for instance, about the laws of physics in a regime where um, they haven't been tested yet. So in that sense, yes, but it's not direct. I mean, it, it, we, we're not uh, learning you know, the, all the detail of what happens between what can be learned in this sort of an accelerator and, and the energy scales that are being probed there. Uh, what we see is that part of our theoretical toolbox, when we apply it, leads to prediction that we verify. But there are still lots of empty space or things which are not verified or checked or whatever. Uh, but we are things we can do, which I didn't even mention, is, say, is things like, well, suppose uh, some of the forces or, or some interactions had a varying strength, okay, as a function of the energy scale as expected, uh, then you can crank, it's part of what I was taking, the no indication of the seventh. You can crank the, turn the crank to sort of know, well, if things were that different, how would this uh, picture here would look different? And the fact that, you, you know, there is no indication of this is turned into a constraint on, on this, for instance, uh, time variation of fundamental constants. So we do this, but this is not what is needed at this time. What we need is rather, as I said, I mean, you know, that there is at least one component, I mean, that the vacuum behaves in a certain way. That's all we've done. Because cosmology is very limited. Um, in some sense, we are not like in the lab where we can touch things and, and, and modify the universe and so on. I mean, we cannot do this. So, we ha I mean, we can only look at, you know, what happened and maybe look in a different place to sort of see that we understand what's happening. But so it's, it's very frustrating. So we can only, in a big part of cosmology, we can only deal with things that affect gravity because gravity is king or queen on, on large scales. So when you, when you play with gravity, yes, beware, cosmology is after you. Uh, but then there are other parts where we can't say very much. So in some sense, it's, um, this information, these six parameters, is, is, is somewhat poor uh, because it's uh, putting under the rug a lot of things. But they are irrelevant, but these things are ver very important for some things, but, the but they are completely irrelevant for the history of the universe. So cosmology is about the history of the universe, the structures and so on, and so only things that affect directly this can be can we learn something about that? So that's why uh, we, we cannot, uh, it's not an accelerator, in other words, and so we have no knobs directly. <coughs> and, and by the way, there are mics in the back, so feel free to go to the mic in the back as well, but you can. Yes, sir. Uh, I mean, let me thank you for a very informative and insightful lecture. Uh, 
Uh, my, uh, there are two questions, they are related actually. Uh, the, in that six basic thing which you mentioned, the first that the physics is uh, constant throughout the universe. I mean, the laws, the laws of the physics is the same throughout. Oh, yes, yes, yes. That's, uh, so, um, it's a very big one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, uh, like when we say, I mean, in one way we say that there are fluctuations and, uh, I mean, which has nothing to do with the laws as such. But why this law has not, I mean, uh, to put it very, I mean, very crudely, why there are no fluctuations in the law throughout the universe? I mean, that is one. Mm -hmm. And secondly, these laws are applicable only uh, for the 5% of the universe, if I stand. No, no, no. Uh, no, no, the laws are applicable for everything. I mean, they, including, uh, the 95, some, including the 95%. Some, uh, some laws are only for some components, but we need them all. Uh, we are applying essentially all the laws of physics to actually deal with this. Now, let me get back to your first point, uh, which is, no, 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 it's not fluctuations of the law. It's, it's a medium to which we apply the law, which is fluctuating. So, I mean, when you, when you, when you look at electromagnetic phenomena, you are not changing Maxwell equations, right? I mean, this is the same equations that describe everything in different uh, environments, and we do it just the same. Uh, we boldly assume that the laws that we can uh, learn about around us in the lab or in the solar system and so on, that, that can still be applied in different regimes. And that's how physics deals all the time. Uh, you know, you, you try to find a model or, or more ambitiously a law that describes some things and then you carry it to some new phenomena and then once you've done this and it works very well, you keep pushing it to new phenomena till it breaks because that's how you improve the laws. At some point, you reach a different realm of energy, of time of reaction, of whatever. It's usually, it's very often energy. And we're suddenly, or speed, which is also, and then suddenly you realize, mm, ah, that doesn't work quite. quite. So, um, it's actually, gravity is a very good example. You know, we have this, our modern life is, is essentially arising from, from Newton and the, the realization of the power of physics and you could describe an apple and a planet by the same laws. Um, and, the and, and the apples didn't stop falling from the same way when there was general relativity. Simply, we realize that when bodies are moving really fast, and where they are really massive, there are corrections. And there are corrections such that we have to rethink completely how to deal with it. But that doesn't change the fact. So putting it short, what we are progressing uh, in, as physicists, we keep pushing the boundaries of knowledge by going into places which are extreme uh, to learn about the laws of physics and possibly whether they break or how they need to be you know, adjusted. So that's pretty much what we have been doing. We have been doing physics, well, in the context of astronomy, that is, you can't touch, <laughs> that's, you can only see, uh, but that's what we do. And we've been applying the same laws, um, and, or, or sometimes extensions, and uh, we've seen if, whether this works or not. And so far, the trip has been pretty fruitful. So I'll take one uh, question from the I just have online a audience uh, yeah. before, you, before I go back to you. So what the question is, uh, are there galaxies that are farther than 14 billion light years away because the no. space must have expanded? Uh, um, you remember, I mean, if you look at the machine back in time, uh, it took about 200 million years. So it's 13.8 billion years minus 200 million. Uh, and before that, there is just nothing. I mean, nothing, no, well. No, I think she's uh, I, wondering about this, that the space must have expanded by the, between us and the origin of Oh, the yes, I mean, yeah. we, I mean the, we are, even though I've been telling you about the observable universe, of course, we don't think that the universe has a boundary. I mean, uh, the, the most common picture is that this is, you know, something without any boundaries, even though that also can be checked, but that's a different story. Um, and so, you can Im just, I mean, actually the, si the simulations I showed you is a very good example. I mean, I put you this cube, which you can think of as a very big part of the universe. Okay, just, a ju just think of a gigantic one, the one where I put gravity in the computer. Well, 
to think that you are one person somewhere. I mean, you know, you are an observer, you happen to be there. So you will see around you, okay, uh, a sphere, but, and of course, there is no way you can see what is further away because there has been no time in the history of the universe for light to propagate all the way to you. By definition, what had time to propagate to, to you is inside this observable universe that I pictured for you. So anything, I mean, this is carved out of something that is in principle a priori or at, at minima infinite. So yes, we expect billions uh, of galaxies out there that we will never be in touch with. And then there is, uh, you know, the multiverse, and this is even yeah. worse. But that's that's yet another layer. Can I? Yeah, thank you for a very engaging uh, lecture, uh, Professor. Uh, I have a very uh, simple uh, question, is that we know uh, that the cosmic temperature is around 2.7 Kelvin across very uniform. Uh, why there is no fluctuation in the temperature? Is there a link between that and uh, background? Well, these are fluctuations of 2.7. Simply it's 2.7 to 5, and then you add zeros, and then the digits there, you have fluctuations of 100. So the micro-Kelvin uh, fluctuations that you mentioned Yes, there? I mean, okay. what you can sort of see, this is called a monopole. This is a sort of a typical mean. And you don't see anything because the fluctuations on 2.7 Kelvin are at the level of 100 millionth of a Kelvin. So these are tiny fluctuations that it take a lot of magnifying power, if you want, of, or increasing the contrast. So that explains why in the initial phase, um, you know, what you saw was, uh, what, what humans saw was essentially something amazingly, amazingly homogeneous, which actually came a long way toward establishing that this was cosmic in origin, because you were not expecting to see one particular direction, like if it was coming to a galaxy or to an object. But then superimposed on this are these tiny fluctuations. So the 2.7 is the t temperature of the bath of the photon that we get on average of 400 photons per cubic centimeter. And we're all about these little fluctuations around the mean. That's what we do. Okay, I'll take one question from the online audience also. Uh, what, do we know, what, do we mo what more do we know about dark energy and dark matter? <laughs> all right, so, we, uh, so maybe we can buy sandwiches and... <laughs> um, all right, so uh, we know negative things. Well, first of all, we know uh, from cosmology the influence it has on cosmology. And that's why it was introduced in the first place. So dark matter is essentially matter, we expect, uh, that behaves as matter, but that has very uh, weak interactions with all the rest of the matter, the, what we call the baryons and so on. I mean, the protons and the neutrons that we are made of. Uh, they are more akin to something like neutrinos which are, you know, neutrinos can pass through the us and actually through the whole Earth without any interaction. So these are particles of this type. They, we, we demonstrated that they were not neutrinos uh, back in the, uh, I think, end of the 80s. Mm -hmm. uh, because, it, well, I don't, no, I'm not going to give you a full lecture on this. So we demonstrated they were not neutrinos. So they are things which are weakly interacting, that is passing through, you know, the material bodies like us very easily, um, but that's not neutrinos. Now we've built detectors uh, which uh, um, around certain simplifying assumptions so that they would be uh, of a certain mass range because, for, because that's where we were expecting them uh, with a particular way of coupling to the rest of matter and we build big detectors and we found nothing. And each generation, I mean, uh, when you go to conferences for the last 30 years, we've just seen exclusion curves, which is showing that it cannot be there, it cannot be there, it sort of pushes things um, to the point where pretty soon it's going to be very hard to do much better because uh, we have neutrinos from the sun and so on, which will prevent us from doing much better. But that's just one particular corner. There are uh, particle physicists have plenty of ideas of other of, of particles which could be in different mass ranges like axions, uh, ultralight, and so on. So, you know, we we are a little bit. We just have the signature of the effect 
Now we are trying to find what is it causing, and for that we need usually, I mean, the, 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 the biggest properties are the mass and how it interacts, how, where is the strength of the interaction with the rest of matter. So these are the sort of, so this leaves a big parameter space, and we are just carving through this, some pieces, but there are still a lot left. Uh, so that's one thing. Now there are also other hypotheses, which is, uh, of course, I mean, maybe this is a signature that there is something wrong with the way we, we use gravity. That may be one thing that is also coming back from dark energy. So dark energy is the same idea that what I introduced, so that's all I wanted to say for dark matter. So dark uh, energy. I would try more little black holes and matches. Yeah, that's one option. Again, I say there was a wide mass range and primordial black holes have a window there. Now, dark energy was, was added later on in the cosmological mix uh, because it was discovered by looking precisely at the equivalent of Hubble low uh, with supernovae, I mean different objects, and it was found that their relationship between the reddening and the estimate of distance was not exactly as we were expecting it to be. And that was also a Nobel Prize, and it was realized that the universe, instead of uh, constantly deceler decelerating with time, uh, a while ago started to reaccelerate. So that was very surprising, uh, and it was then realized that it needed the same kind of solution that inflation, that is something similar to the energy of the vacuum. Okay, it may even it may even may be the manifestation of the same thing. Uh, in some theories. So now the field is wide open. What is it? You know, you have some idea of what it needs to have so that it inflates the universe when you expand it. So you have some particular property, which is called an equation of state, which govern this. We know what it has to be to be a successful ingredient for our model. So we know that. But we don't know what is it exactly. I mean, is it a field? Is, what is it? And how is it connected with the rest of physics? Well, we don't know. So we are there, again, shooting a little bit in the dark um, by, uh, well, the, after playing the next big endeavor in the European Space Agency is the Euclid satellite. And the Euclid satellite science case is, is and, and the PI is actually just three doors away in my institute. So I'm, you know, it's, <laughs> I, I sort of know a little bit about this, and this is really about um, trying to know with much greater precision what is this equation of state, these characteristics uh, that is used, uh, the cosmology means. Um, but we are also, so theorists there are also playing the same game that it's actually interesting. It's a little bit the same thing than for CMB. So you can have also, you can have an idea for what dark energy is. You have a model, and so you turn the crank, and the turn of the crank might require quite a number of graduate students and so on, but you end up with a prediction, right? And then we will do the experiment, and either we find that this is, you know, just behaving like a cosmological constant, and all of these theories will essentially happily die, or not happily die away, uh, or maybe we'll say, oh, it has exactly the properties, just think of the fingerprint. Same thing, we are building the atlas, of what could be the dark energy, and we are trying to find the fingerprint of the universe to make the connection with the theoretical atlas. The only problem there is that we are not quite as blessed as for the CMB, where the signature is these bumps and wiggles with lots of characteristics, so it has a lot of information. Well, uh, the, the, the basic effect of this dark energy is, um, has much less bumps and wiggles. So it's harder to identify uh, characteristics of, of different models. Okay, so, so in short, uh, we, have, we know that we have something that behaves like the two containers that I've just described, which are called dark energy and dark matter. But these are just stickers on the unknown. They are just telling us there is something that behaves like, like this, according to the laws of physics, and that does this. What is it? <laughs> we don't know. 
And so we are busy on all sides, theorists, instrumentalists, astronomers, to actually build both the atlas on one end and the machines to try to find the fingerprint. So that's where we are. Uh, and there are, I will conclude on, on a final statement on this particular question, which is um, the two are on the, despite the fact that they are sticker on a container, they have this in common, they are not quite at the same level from the physics point of view. Um, because, hey, uh, additional particles, I mean, it's been with, uh, with, with particle physicists forever. There, there, there are lots. We, it's, it's just a question of finding the, the, which one. It may not be the right explanation, but we have plethoras of, of, of explanation. Dark energy is a different thing. I mean, dark energy, if you apply it to standard physics and so on, you get to a ridiculously wrong answer. To the point that this is shaking the basics of physics, of theoretical physics at least. And so there, uh, it may be revealing something really profound as a limitation to, you know, our understanding of physical laws of the universe and that leads to all kinds of speculations and, being, and things really wild um, out of desperation. So uh, they, are, they have a slightly different status, and, uh, but in all cases, we are questioning, as we should, uh, the, the, the basement on physics, that is the lows, and, and we are asking where. Maybe GR has to be revised. Maybe we need to have fundamentally different uh, you know, view of what uh, of quantum cosmology and so on. So there are lots of these open avenues, which is just saying, yeah, phil physics is well and alive, and cosmology is part of it, and it's a great field to be in. Okay, we will take l last two questions and one from here. There is and a one woman from here. There, there is a lady there that okay. wants Would to ask a right, question. Good. A priori, yes. I mean, these are supposed to be pervasive, so they should be absolutely everywhere. Just like there are microwave background photons all around us, okay, I mean, everywhere. Uh, dark matter particles are probably, pa I mean, well, if they exist in this form I described, they are just going through us at this very moment. Um, and uh, we are building detectors precisely. Well, actually, we are putting them under <laughs> uh, at, at great depth so that the usual particles are stopped. Uh, so, yes. And for dark energy, well, I didn't say this was a particle, but uh, yes, it's supposed to be absolutely everywhere. Yes. Oh, I think I see what you are driving at. Yes, <laughs> it's driving the expansion, but that doesn't mean that because it's, uh, it's uh, overruling everything else on large scales that this happens on small scales. Right now, I'm inflating, but this has to do with the food I'm eating. <laughs> I mean, that is not having to do uh, you know, with the universe expansion. Okay, so let's be very clear. So actually, on relatively small scales, Gravity does the job of holding things together. So you are not expanding. Well, apart from this minor additional, no, you are thin, it's clean. But, um, but our solar system is not expanding. Our galaxy is not expanding. And even clusters of galaxies are not expanding. And this is about the size where, thing, where gravity stops holding things together. This is about the larger scales where the density, the attraction is strong enough to compensate for the expansion. On scales larger than this, everything else expands. OK, th maybe the second last question from here. Uh, uh, OK, uh, my question is, uh, so when we look deep into the uh, cosmos, we see the universe in its infancy, sort of. So, uh, so in that way, we can see the, the earliest of the galaxies being formed. So, and the universe is expanding. So are we able to see our own uh, baby Milky Way in its infancy, uh, even though we are in it? Yes and no. Uh, if you are talking literally our own Milky Way, certainly no. Having things equivalent to the Milky Way, yes, this is exactly what we're doing. 
there, at this very remote location, I will be able to see it, but it has developed. It's these fluctuations that we are mapping. This, uh, they, they, are, they have developed in their own large scale structures, their galaxies, and so on, that we are not watching. But as I, I warn you, you, you have a time machine, but this time machine is you can only see things in the past which are far away. So there is no way of looking at us where we are. The only option would be having a, a, a black hole. And, so, and essentially, you don't, I mean, there is no causality problem and so on. You are just watching things as they were in a remote part. Okay, so we, we can't uh, be sure about the history. No, you won't, you won't be able to know how to observe how our Milky Way was. What you can do, and we are busy doing this, is to look at how our neighborhood was many years back. That is, we're trying to use the laws of physics to invert the time machine locally. That is, yes, we're doing this. We're looking at the you know, various masses around us and we're trying to measure the velocity and then to turn gravity backward to sort of know how it came about and so on. And the fact, as you've heard from Gaia, that you know, there was another galaxy that collided us. So we are trying to build a movie locally, but we're not observing it. Okay. We're just using you know, X and V to, and, and the lows to go back in time. Okay, so we are reverting the trajectories, but we are not observing it. All right, one last question. No, 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 no. Okay. I will take, ah. take a whole, you have ration for questions. So you, one last question from here, and then you're done. Hello, okay. sir. Um, my question is, like, when universe consists of both matter and antimatter, why is it dominated only by the matter? I don't know. And the other... <laughs> <laughs> and do you believe in the theory of multiverse? Do you believe that multiverse yes. exists? Hmm. Well, first Maybe of all, like uh, okay, first I'm a physicist, <laughs> so belief is, you know, it's not really my job. I mean, I'm, uh, I, I'm trying to build models and so on. Um, now, multiverse is, uh, is something that came about as a p potential answer to some problems and as a consequence of some, uh, say, modeling, okay, uh, now, which is extremely speculative. So it may or may not be there. The, the, the problem uh, to ask, and this is a raging debate in, among physicists, whether this is still physics, okay, that because this is a question that is being asked, is this boils down to, the, to one question. Is it still physics if you cannot observe it? If there is nothing that you can do in the universe, that will tell whether this is true or not. So, well, uh, the old school, from which I am I'm firmly part of, is if you cannot test it, this is not part of physics. This is an interesting speculation. It may, it's, it's part of a, a physics exercise. That is, it's, it's not unreasonable that a small part of the theoretical physicists that play with these kind of concepts and try to think whether there would be potentially a consequence that would be observable by means that we can't see because it's actually very much against the principle of, the, of that thing. But so we have to be open, but it's really sort of a speculations by a very small group of people, uh, which uh, is not, uh, for now, has no foreseeable consequences that can be used to either bring evidence towards it or against it. Okay, so that's okay. all I can say. So this is really a very last question to the Queen, uh, gentleman, the Queen. Yeah. Uh, yes, there was sir. this gentleman there that was uh, desperately <laughs> waving his hand, but uh, anyway. This would probably require a very short answer from you, Professor. Just as Einstein's thought experiments resulted in testable hypotheses that we now base a lot of our understanding of the universe upon, do you think there is a possibility that string theory that combines quantum theory and Einsteinian gravity at uh, the 11th dimension could possibly, in your estimation, yield some insights into the study of the cosmos? Yes, I mean, this is certainly the hope of many of my colleagues at ICTS. Uh, 
uh, and I'm certainly not a string specialist, even though I worked on cosmic strings for many years, but that's a different breed of strings. Um, it's certainly the hope, uh, but now maybe most of, some of the most brilliant hypothesis, uh, at least from my outside view, uh, I'm not a stringer, right? I mean, uh, is that uh, it al allowed progress in mathematics, mathematical physics, if you wish, uh, as well as condensed matter physics through big surprises, b correspondence between two different fields of physics where one problem that looks difficult in one domain looks simpler in the other. So yes, it's been making progress in those areas. Now, in terms of the fundamental description of the universe and having something that you can actually go after, uh, there is very little to be put under your teeth. Um, maybe the, 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 the main thing that is there is actually a negative prediction. That is, uh, there is no gravitational waves primordial to be seen. Okay, so, uh, so it, it, it is firmly in the camp of science, is if, if primordial gravitational waves are seen, then there is some revision that will have to be happening in the string theory, as I understand it. But I'm fully confident that my colleagues that are saying this cannot happen will find a way to make it happen if, mm. it's, if it's discovered in real. Thank you. So, uh, uh, what can I say? I mean, this is uh, it's something that I've been uh, watching. I mean, you know, I, I would love having something to grab and be able to sort of see whether we can, you know, find it or not. For now, uh, for the cosmologists, this is, uh, we, we just have this negative thing to live with. But that not, does not prevent us from keep pushing and, you know, as I said, if we find a primordial gravitational wave background, they'll find a way to explain it. Yeah, yeah, there was this guy that we was really desperate somewhere. Yes, so why, why not? Yes, go for it. I, I'd like to ask a question about the picture of the cosmic background. Yes. So if, if the universe is flat... Get closer to the mic. If the universe is flat and yes. finite, does that mean that... I didn't say finite. Okay, if, if they, how would it look, the picture, like, from, say, 13 billion light years away? Would it look significantly different? Or? I'm not sure I understood the question. I mean, the, the only thing you see is you see to a finite distance, so the only thing you see is a sphere. You cannot say anything no, more. No, if you were looking at it from... Uh, speak in front of the mic. If you were looking at the picture from further away. Oh, well... No, you, I mean, what you can do is to see another picture. Think of it. I mean, think you are, you are in the universe like you are sort of a super being, you know, you can sort of locate, relocate you in another galaxy. Well, you are not violating the laws of physics, so you are looking around you, and you are looking the light, the, a sphere whose radius is the distance that light could have traveled since the universe became transparent. So you're looking at a different sphere. So, of course, it will be very similar if it's just nearby. Now, if you take a completely different point in the, in the universe, in, in a, it outside of the observable universe, you will see a totally different um, sky. It will have nothing in common. Well, and then you can sort of go for refinement, this ultra-long wavelength and so on. I mean, I'm, uh, but, but in essence, I mean, we're just observing a two-dimensional surface, or nearly a two-dimensional surface, carved out of a three-dimensional volume, and each observer watches a different sphere around it, and the sphere is just defined by, you know, um, the distance that light could travel since the time the universe became transparent. So, I mean, it is our observable universe, it is not the universe, and so that's exactly why I was saying we cannot make, from the theory side, a prediction of how things look like in detail. We can only talk about statistics. On average, how the waves should be as a function of... Because that, on average, would also apply to this other observer in another part of the universe. This is called... I mean, this amounts to, in the end, uh, make a connection with ensemble averaging which is a little bit too much for uh, that audience.
I'm sure that there are a lot of burning questions. I suggest that we discuss further questions over coffee out there. Sure. So let's thank uh, Professor Boucher for this wonderful exposition.